Okay, hi everybody and welcome to another Real Wonder Camera podcast. We're back over in the States, East Coast this time, with Calvin Von Crush. I mean, Calvin, that is one great name that you've got there, <laughs> for starters. And he is the occult collector. He is at the top of his game. He's going to talk us through some of his collection and it's just going to blow your mind. So welcome on the show, mate. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So what have you been up to, first of all? You know, I know you've just come, you've been over to the UK doing a little bit of a grave spotting and all sorts of stuff, haven't you, man? So, which is really cool. Yeah, I was over uh, speaking at Sage Paracon at Coombe Abbey in uh, Coventry. And then uh, I took myself on a bit of a holiday, as you guys say. And uh, traveled all over. I rented a car. I got to drive on the other side of the road for the first time. That was pretty exciting. Um, and then uh, most recently, I just did a magician's convention called East Coast Spirit Sessions down in Myrtle Beach. So it's magicians who kind of use um, uh, occult themes in their magic, uh, spirit communication and, and the like. Uh, okay. Sort of like um, in our back in the UK, we have Darren Brown. Have you ever heard of him? No, I don't think I have. Yeah, he does that. He sort of uses like um, seance type stuff and he's pretty psychic as well, which is really cool. So he sort of gets that sort of vibe, which is awesome. So so that was just like, were you able to buy bits and stuff or what was it about then? Uh, no, I just did a uh, lecture on uh, spirit communication tools because a lot of these magicians use similar devices in their magic routines. So they had me come in and kind of give the history on these items that they might actually not know the origins of. Ah, okay. Sort of what, like your Ouija boards and your seance tools, magic boards, that sort of stuff. Exactly. It? Oh, cool. So what got, what got you into collecting this sort of stuff at an early age? You know, because it's quite a different uh, one, isn't Great it? question. So I, um, I, I grew up Catholic. I, I grew up believing in uh, the paranormal. My family had all these crazy ghost stories uh, involving, you know, uh, ghosts and devils and Ouija boards. And I never had an experience like that for myself. And, you know, as I grew older, I kind of distanced myself from religion, but I think I still had a strong belief in the paranormal. So I felt if there was a way for me to experience it myself, it might be by gathering up some of these items and welcoming them into my home. You know, there's a lot of people in the paranormal world who say stay away from Ouija boards or items with dark history because you don't know exactly what you're inviting into your life. And I figured I'd roll the dice and give it a shot for myself and see if it worked out. <laughs> and, it, and it's worked out all right then, mate, hasn't it, basically? I think uh, with thus far, not a single bump in the night has ever convinced me that ghosts are real. I actually believed more in the paranormal when I started collecting and now that I'm, you know, almost 20 years in the game, I don't believe in an afterlife or ghosts or anything like that at all. Oh, that's unusual. So do you believe that it's all like linked to the magic trick sort of side of it, do you? I, I think a lot of the uh, paranormal um, can be explained away by psychology. And, you know, it's not just black or white. You know, you can't just say one or the other. But I think each individual case um can very much be explained by psychological responses right okay so do you think because it's like i've always thought that with ouija boards it's almost the willing of people to move the objects that sort of thing well you know ouija boards uh, were first invented in the 1890s and one of the reasons why they've remained so popular to this very day is because they do elicit a psychological response uh, called the idiomotor response. It's essentially your body producing movement when you're expecting one. So Ouija boards technically really do work, but you're not having a conversation with the dead. You're essentially having a conversation with yourself. And if that didn't really, you know, trigger that response, it would be no greater than a piece of wood with the alphabet painted on it. All right. Okay. Yeah. I sort of get that. Do you think it's more like a, um, you're more talking to your subconscious? Do you know, a deeper level of yourself? Uh, essentially, yes. So if you go into a situation thinking you're talking to, you know, a dead relative, you're, you're going to get that kind of conversation. But people have used Ouija boards to communicate with everything from Bigfoot to extraterrestrials. 
So it's it's kind of giving yourself the result that you're expecting. Yeah, you could use that tool to talk to anything. I would love to like be in one where they're talking to Bigfoot. Man, that sounds cool. <laughs> You know, that would just be great, wouldn't it? Talking to Bigfoot for a Ouija board. <laughs> oh, that would be great, man. Yeah. <laughs> so have you experienced a, a lot of, have you done seances? Have you done the Ouija boards? Do you do it yourself or do you just collect the items? You know, I've never really gotten a Ouija board to work for myself. Um, I don't know if I'm just not drinking the Kool-Aid enough. But, uh, I mean, I've I've met a number of people who believe they can communicate with the other side, but none of them have ever been able to produce any serious evidence of what they're doing is legit. You know, it's always vague answers and, you know, things that are roughly there. They can never just give you the exact answer you're looking for. And then when I ask why, they always say it's things like, oh, it doesn't work like that, you know. But I, I find um, a lot of them guess. I've asked the same question to a number of psychics and I've gotten 20 different answers. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I think it's a desire to believe that that kicks in more than actual substance. Do you think one day you're actually going to find someone who, and then you're going to start believing? Do you think there's someone out there that's going to sway you? I wish, that, I hope. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the reasons why um, I, I am so invested in the paranormal um, it's because I am possessed with a very profound uh, death anxiety. Um, I'm, I'm a nihilist atheist, man. I, I don't think there's anything after this. When my light switch gets flicked off, that's it. And I would love someone to be able to give me um, concrete evidence that there is a continuation of consciousness when we're done. So it, it would just give me a lot of peace. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm running around wearing a helmet everywhere I go because I'm, I'm that afraid of dying. I'm, I definitely uh, live a pretty adventurous life. But I think uh, at the end of the road, knowing that there is no afterlife for me is pretty terrifying. Man, you know what you want to do? You want to get down to South America and you want to do a load of that ayahuasca, mate. Then you will believe. <laughs> oh, my, my friend, I would, I would love to. <laughs> um, I've, I've tried DMT and DMT is pretty, pretty wild. So, um, yeah. you know, and ayahuasca yeah. does have DMT in it. Yeah, uh, it's the same yeah, thing. I hear ayahuasca is uh, definitely way more of an adventure than people think. <laughs> so you didn't get that experience from doing DMT that you thought that there was, we're going to be a bit off track here, but so you didn't think that their consciousness continued through doing that experience? Because most people are like, yeah, no, there's definitely it, something. I mean, it's literally brain chemicals, you know, that's, yeah. that's all it really is. I mean, don't get me wrong. I had an amazing experience. Um, mm. I, I saw beings that I knew weren't there. I heard music that wasn't there. Mm. Um, it was, it was definitely a very warm, loving feeling, but mm. I don't think it was divinity. I don't think it was proof of an afterlife or proof mm. of a soul. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's mad. I've everybody who I've spoken to, who's had them experiences, those plant medicine experiences take you to the other side. have always come out of it. Like, yeah, there's definitely something. And it sort of relieves the fear of dying, you know, because they think, Oh, there is something after that. It's almost, but maybe that's because they've experienced their ego dying. I don't know. It's a funny one. Anyway, we, we better get off, off this topic, I think, Calvin, and get back to, like, you know, the occult Ouija boards and stuff like that, because that's why you're really here, mate, isn't it? Um, so well, I mean, one? dude, honestly, it's all connected. Yes, you know, yeah, if, I totally if agree. If you ever look at, you know, um, the, the way human culture has developed, a lot of it has uh, been brought to you by hallucinogens. There's some anthropologists mm. who believe that, um, you know, hallucinogenic mushrooms may have been the foundation for society itself. Yeah, the and Stone it's theory through the use. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's through the use of these things that people's minds do open up and, and do allow them to accept occult practices or gods or mm. afterlives and stuff like that. So uh, if we are going to talk about the supernatural and the paranormal, we do have to have the conversation that a lot of the concepts may have been provoked by hallucinogens. Yeah, I totally agree because um, people who go down and do these ayahuasca trips and stuff, they all seem the same sort of entities as well. You know, so there's a, 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 a 
conscious, a collective consciousness in there somewhere that they see the same, you know, they come back, have the same story as the next person. You know, they saw like, usually it's like a Jaguar or whatever, and the, you know, the Gaia, whatever they see, you know, but it's the same sort of entities and there's a similar similarity. And then you look back in time and it's like elves and pixies and all this sort of stuff. And then the link with the mushrooms and pixies and all it's all intertwined. So yeah, there's definitely something there. Um, really interesting yeah. topic. We could probably do a full podcast on that. Could oh, we? yeah, we could talk an hour on just that. <laughs> yeah. So should we get down to seeing some of these items? Because I'm desperate to see some of your stuff, mate, because it's cool. Yeah. I was looking, I was um, looking at something the other day. Is there any at... field of the... Is there any I'll... field of the occult or paranormal that interests you the most? Oh, I don't know, really. All of it, mate. That, I mean, it's so interesting to um, just learn about all these different things. That I mean, I'm sort of quite fascinated about seances, you know, especially in the UK. Like, cool. You know, I got before, something for you then. Yeah, before, like, um, in the Victorian times, obviously it was massive over here. Like, it was like you went out around someone's house, you had a seance. You know, you didn't go around. You might have played a bit of bridge or whatever, a few card games, and then you probably have a seance, you know, and it was like yeah. most weeks, you know, so and it just interests me, that does, especially. Well, you know, the Victorian era was ushered in by Queen Victoria's great state of mourning. And, you know, it, death, especially, you know, in the States, when we had the Civil War and everything around that time, it was it was just on the forefront of everybody's thoughts. You know, life was way harder back then. You, you and for every one person that died in the Civil War, it was an American citizen. So it, it was somebody on American ground that had family all over the place. So it was just this constant state of loss. And I think that's why people turn to um, a fascination with the dead. You know, we had the uh, Egyptian mummy unwrapping parties, seances, uh, things like that, you know. I mean, death culture in itself, uh, especially regarding funerals and funeral rituals and practices, was just so prevalent at the time. Mm. Well, I think as well, Calvin, in we used to celebrate death a lot more. Now it's like a really gloomy sort of funeral and it's sort of quite sad and loads of tears. But in like Western cultures and, you know, probably like uh, earlier than Victoria times, maybe, it would have been more a celebration. And especially like when you go out into say the more occult practices, it's more a celebration of death, you know, a celebration of moving on to something, even though you don't think it, but a lot of people think somewhere better, you know? So it's sort of like a celebration. It's like the Tibetan book of the dead and the Egyptian book of the dead, you know, they were all used to gather information about when you're going to die and what you're going to do, you know? So, yeah. It's changed a lot. Yeah, I mean, especially like in in the modern era, I think death has become such a taboo thing. You know, Mm. it's like an out of sight, out of mind kind of concept. And um, the fact that it's just become so monetized, you know, it's a a billion dollar industry. And Mm. even think about the way we preserve the dead. You know, we're pumping in all these chemicals to stop a natural process from happening. It's almost like we're trying to convince ourselves that decay isn't part of being alive, you know, like mm. we're trying to push it back as far as we can. Mm. Yeah. And that, that also sort of links with like the, the mushrooms as well, because obviously the mushrooms and all of that are all linked to the earth, aren't they? And they were what you, you're giving back your body to the earth, you know? And we're like, you're saying by pumping it through the chemicals and stuff like that, you're sort of stopping the, the earth from having its minerals and stuff back, you know, for another go, basically, right. you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Right. Let's see this say on stuff then, mate. What you got? All right. Uh, so this is one of my prized possessions. Uh, this is a piece that I had worked on for very many years to acquire. And it's going to be hard for the camera to pick this up, but believe it or mm-hmm. not, this is a talking board. Whoa. So, you know, we, we've said the word Ouija board and we have to remember that the word Ouija is a name brand. It's like Coca-Cola or Ford or anything like that. Right. So um, a device with letters and numbers and short answers, 
uh, with a moving uh, selector called a planchette is called a talking board. And this one was created by a gentleman named Glenn Renner Smith. Glenn Renner Smith was a, uh, a spiritualist. He lived in a town called Lilydale in upstate New York. Lilydale is a town that is populated by other spiritualists. It's a whole communica- uh, community of people who believe they can communicate with the other side. Okay. And uh, he happened to be the sign painter of that town. Um, all the psychic mediums who live there have little signs on the outside of their houses um, that specify who they are and what kind of mediumship they do. You know, there's trance mediums, there's trumpet mediums, um, there's um, artists who create art with the aid of spirit. And he would paint the signs that hung inside of their houses. And he just so happened to have a painter's palette. Right, okay, yeah. And scribbled on there with pencil is the alphabet and numbers and yes and no. And um, I had first seen it pop up at auction and I thought the price tag was just way too much. And I let it slip through my fingers and I regretted it for very, 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 very many years. <laughs> and um, I ended up finding it um, buried on somebody's website um, where they had a, um, you know, it was a, an online museum and this was one of the items that was featured. So I ended up getting it. It, it took me, man, six, seven years to get a hold of it. Yeah. So after I got a hold of it, um, I had already had, which is still hanging up. I, I didn't take it off the wall. I had already had a sign that was hand painted from Lilydale oh, at the oh. same time period that Glenn Renner Smith was painting signs in that town. Nice. So I can't prove it, but there's a very, very good chance that the sign I have is also hand painted by the gentleman who made this talking board. And I had a connection in that town who just happened to have a photograph of Glenn Renner Smith as well. Wow. So here we go. That's him. And that's actually him standing outside of his house in Lilydale. So I did a little research and I found out where he's buried So I took the sign, the talking board, and the photograph, and I brought them all up to upstate New York. I laid them out on his grave, and I took some pictures. So I have pictures of his grave with all the items on top of it. And I borrowed a little bit of dirt from his grave as well. So there's a little bit of Glenn Runner Smith in my collection as well. So it it took years to put all that together. Yeah. That's that's cool as well, because you've obviously done tried so much to research and get that provenance you know and get that collection together yeah. and yeah it's absolutely great mate wow um and the sign writing as well if he'd done all of those different do they often come up at auction his bits of sign writing is he sort of like a well-known one or anything from him specifically yeah does it was that the question yeah no i've, I've never seen anything else with his name on it Oh, wow. That's even cooler. So you've yeah. got that piece. Wow. And that's one of your pride and joys, is it, in your vast collection? Oh, yeah. This is this is definitely one of my all-time favorites. I love that your um, hand behind you as well, Calvin. What is that about? Um, so I know it's hard for you to see, but that's actually a sign that was hanging outside of a, um, a psychic's. And yeah. um, it's two giant pieces of plywood. I actually have to trim the top and the bottom for it to fit inside my house. And I've got pretty tall ceilings here. But um, <laughs> believe it or not, that was a Craigslist find. And uh, I believe it was in Kentucky. And once I found it, um, it was very, very cheap. Um, <laughs> I just had to find a way to get it up to Connecticut. <laughs> so I... I reached out on Facebook and said, do I have any collector friends in Kentucky who could help me? And uh, my buddy, Jason Mosley, who's actually a magician, uh, he reached out and said, hey man, what do you need? I go, do you have a pickup truck? And he goes, I do. I'm like, can you go pick up a giant sign for me? So he did. Uh, I, I, I messaged the uh, seller and said, hey, I'm gonna have somebody come pick it up. Um, I paid via the internet and he picked it up and he brought it back to his garage and he goes, Hey man, if you ever decide you want to sell that, my wife sure likes it. And I'm like, no, I definitely want to bring that home, you know? Yeah, man, that's cool. um, He worked for a company that um, transported uh, medical supplies. 
And he he put it on one of the medical supply trucks and got it up to Baltimore. And they dropped it off in my buddy Nathan Roberts' um, front yard. And then Nathan brought it up to Connecticut for me in his van. Man, that's cool. And that I've noticed that about um, the group that you're in, you know, you all help each other out in America, you know, like you all reach out to each other and you'll be like, yeah, you know, I'll go and pick it up. I'll do this, you know, and you sort of do each other favors. And it's a great community that you've got going, to be honest with you. I always think that, mate. Yeah, because I always speak to um, Nick at Cryptic Curiosities and he's like, yeah, my mate sorted me out with this. And, you know, and it just seems like you're all really good friends. You know, that's that's the weird thing about collecting. You know, I think on a surface level, so many people think it's a um, a superficial materialistic thing. You know, like we're just we're just spending money and, and grabbing shit and throwing it on a shelf. But um, you would not believe the profound relationships I've uh, been able to create through meeting other people who are just as passionate about collecting as I am. You know, I, I've I've met collectors that are family now, you know, um, you know, we, we've laughed together, we've cried together, we've had amazing adventures, and it's it, it's more rewarding than owning the stuff. It, it really is. Oh, that's cool, man. That's really cool. Yeah, that is. I, I got that feeling, you know, when I spoke to, like, a few of you guys who are in your, your same sort of friendship collector group. I sort of always had that feeling that you're quite tight and, you know, and you've really built a real good group of friends which is nice and it helps because you've got eyes out there looking for all these items then because you each have your own little collector's niche as such don't you so you've got right. so many eyes out there hunting you know and it just gains you so many pieces basically because they're like hey calvin i've seen this over here is that you know do you like it and you're like hey man yeah cool you know yeah, i do can you get it and i'll sort you out you know that sort of thing so yeah it's really cool mate we've sort of got the same sort of thing in the uk as well yeah, so anything else you have then, Calvin? You've probably got loads of stuff to show us. Oh, I got tons of stuff on the table for yeah, you. Yeah, let's, let's keep show and telling, mate. I love it. <laughs> so this is an authentic voodoo doll from the 1930s. Oh, right, okay. And this is made out of corn husk. And it looks like there's a bit of tar in it too. And then it's bound with twine. And then you can see there's two iron nails hammered into it. Right. Okay. This is, uh, it would appear in the heart and then maybe in the genitals. So I guess Whoa. they really pissed somebody off, huh? So this voodoo. But, uh, this, this is from the 1930s, like I said. And that comes from, you know, Louisiana. That's where uh, American voodoo is primarily practiced. Right. And American voodoo um, is a. Um, inspired from African voodoo, which was yeah. from the West coast of Africa. And yeah. of course it was brought over to the United States because of the slave trade and mm -hmm. American voodoo kind of incorporated some uh, elements from Catholicism. So it was a new blend. So African voodoo is V O D O U and American yeah, voodoo is V O O D O O. That's voodoo. That's from the, um, that's voodoo on that, that piece is, so they, they used to feed this. Right. Yeah. Um, I can't think I, a lot. It's lost me the exact tribe of what it was. But yeah, Western Africa. Like you say, it's voodoo on, isn't it? And then it came over to America, obviously, with the slaves, didn't it? And then they added different pieces because usually the voodoo on would be uh, something like that, that they would feed um, with different pieces. You know, they would feed this. Yeah. Um, and it would be like a different deity. And there's, you know, hundreds of deities. This one was probably like a monkey deity, but it would be obviously be to protect the village, you know. And then it sort of branched right. off from, from what you're the expert in this, from what I know, it branched off over into America. And then it got a little bit darker with like dolls used for, you know, spiritually hurting people, I would say, if, if you get my drift. Well, you know, the use of dolls or poppets is prevalent in, in so many different occult practices from mm -hmm. around the world. Um, yeah. You know, the idea that um, you can create an effigy um, that can be the embodiment of a spirit or can be used to harm somebody or protect somebody. Um, mm -hmm. It's not exclusively to voodoo. It, it's no, done no. by so many different practices. Yeah. Have you seen? You know, even the Amish. The Amish have an odd belief with dolls as well. 
Um, okay. They don't have dolls with faces um, because they believe that if a doll has a face on it and it looks too human, that it can actually um, have a spirit uh, take hold mm. of it um, and, and can become a problem. Have you seen, and it's been it's been going viral just recently, like on the internet. Have you seen those massive, huge marionette sort of dolls? Have you seen that? And they've been sort of going... Oh, like the ones that are in parades and everything? Yeah, but they're huge and they look so freaky. And one had like a diver's yeah. helmet on and it goes in. I mean, they almost look like they've got an attachment to them, don't they? They're like super <laughs> freaky. I mean, I looked at one, I was like, oh, I don't know whether I'd take the kids to see that parade, to be honest with you. <laughs> you want to see some more? Yes, mate, definitely. Yes, please. All right. So, um, you know, another thing that's very common in a lot of occult practices is the use of vessels, um, you know, um, jars or, um, you know, clay pots or anything like that. Um, whether you're putting an ingredient in to produce uh, an effect or it's going to harbor a spirit or anything like that. It's very common in a lot of different practices. Okay. So um, I've got two different examples of such. Uh, these would be called witch bottles or spell bottles. And uh, this one is from the 1930s. This was from the Scottish American Festival. And I believe this came out of a house. It was probably kept... Um, on a windowsill or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I never open these things when I get them myself, but this one had already been opened. And this one has something very, very cool inside. Right. Okay. These are little Frozen Charlotte dolls. So uh, Frozen Charlottes um, are just little porcelain dolls. And um, I'm not sure if it was a poem or a song, but it's a, a cautionary tale about a girl who freezes to death. And they right. made these little dolls in, um, you know, uh, reference to it. Right. And um, from what I've gathered, I believe this is a protective talisman because there's five dolls in here and they're all bound with red uh, string. And... If I were to wager a guess, it would be there were five family members in the house. So the red string was used as a protective element to kind of keep everybody in that house safe. Right, okay. What sort of age would that be then, Calvin? Do you know roughly? What was that? What Did you say what age that was? Would that come from Scotland originally? Yeah, that's from the 1930s. 1930s. Oh, interesting. So I also have this one. Now, this one is actually made for malicious intent. Oh, right. Okay. Now, if you look at the top, that's actually bound with black wax in what appears to be an animal tooth. Right. Now, when I first got this in the mail, um, you know, when things are transported in the mail, they get handled pretty roughly. Hmm. Well, I opened the box and was immediately hit with the most pungent aroma of urine. It was so intense. And then I picked the jar up, and when I picked the jar up, it was actually hot to the touch. Whoa. So what happened was all the contents of this, um, which is probably um, hair and uh, nails and urine, of course, Mm. Um, the handling had caused the contents to stir up and created a chemical reaction and actually heated up the contents and made it warm to the touch. And when I tell you it was hot, when I grabbed it, I slammed it down immediately because it was so shocking at how warm it was. Wow. And um, it doesn't smell anymore. Um, it, it's since settled down. But when I first got it, it was very, very overwhelming. And see, now we know that that's a chemical reaction, don't we? But in the olden days, that, that would have been a spirit, wouldn't it? You know, people would have thought the well, heat would have come I mean, from a spirit. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, P is P, bro. Like, people are going to know that, it, that there's urine in there, whether they think it's a spirit or not. There's no disguising that. 
Yeah, true. I get that. But, but <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying there. Well, you never know. They obviously sort of, but yeah, you're right. I can't, I can't get around that. You're definitely right. We is we, for sure. Yeah. Right, what, else, <laughs> what else have you got, mate? Um, okay, so in in the United States, we have a chain of mountains called the Appalachian Mountains. And um, they're a very odd-shaped um, formation. And because of this formation, you had all these little pockets of isolated communities. And because of this, these little communities kind of developed their own individual folklores and legends and superstitions. Mm -hmm. And one of the most fascinating superstitions that come out of that region is that involving feathered death crowns. And that's what I have here. Okay. This is a keepsake that was passed down in somebody's family and written um, in pen on the cover of the box is the details of who these feather crowns belong to. And the um, story goes that there were uh, one for each grandparent and then another small one for a young girl who had died as well. So belief of a feather death crown is that um, inside down pillows, you know, pillows that are filled with feather stuffing, Mm -hmm. yep. If um, somebody is on their deathbed and you reach into the pillow and you feel a lump and you pull it out, um, it is essentially a compressed circle of feathers. Okay. So almost like a crop circle of feathers, you know? Yeah. Now, the belief was that if you found one of these, you could break it apart and prevent the person from passing. But it was also believed that if you found one in their pillow after they had passed, it meant that they were carried to heaven on the wings of angels. You know, of course, you know, angels' wings being feathered. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the grandparents. But look at this tiny one for this child. How cool is that? Wow. And um, it's, it's really just a legend that's isolated to those communities along the Appalachian Mountains. You know, there's a, a number of them in some of the museums down there, the folk art museums and, and whatnot. And a lot of these are kept in people's families and passed down for many, many years. Yeah, something very special because obviously they've got that attachment to the person that died, like a, a memento mori type thing of the person, you know, which is amazing, isn't it? Like that. Yeah, I've never, ever heard of that or seen that. So thanks, Calvin, because that they're great you know uh sort of something um yeah the notion of them being carried away is such a nice thing as well isn't it you know you sort of you yeah. imagine your imagination you know, that goes, goes back it. to um that was going back to you know what i say about the um the paranormal being to be able to explain with psychology you know mm. this is clearly a natural phenomenon that happens it probably has something to do with the weight of a human head and body heat and friction and just the way it mats down the feathers. You know, just imagine somebody's head rocking back and forth while they're sleeping. Mm, it could very yeah. well just twist those feathers together. Yeah, of course, yeah. But, you know, believing that an angel carried your loved one to heaven after they pass mm. um, probably offered a great deal of comfort to someone who was mourning. Yeah, and then they would treasure that item as well because of that, wouldn't they? Like you said, and they would be kept in the family. Oh, absolutely, family. absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely amazing. That's so cool. Um, so, you know, the Appalachian Mountains is actually home to a number of uh, cryptozoology creatures. You know, we've got Mothman coming from that region, right. the Flatwoods um, Monster, and yeah. there's countless tales of, you know, ape-like creatures in the woods. Yeah. But cool. uh, so many people have faked evidence to indicate that those creatures are there. We were just talking about how cool it would be able to talk to Bigfoot via Ouija board. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah. what I have here are some homemade Bigfoot feet. Oh, my. Check Look these out. Them. Wow. Yeah. So um, I don't know the exact age on these, but the leather is incredibly, incredibly old. If I were to wager a guess, I would say it's probably from the 1950s, maybe earlier. Cool. And... Uh, yeah, somebody made these to put on their feet and walk in the woods and make it look like Bigfoot was stomping around. 
it's it's mad because I can remember when we were like younger, we used to mess about with a video recorder and we went into the forest and one of my friends, we actually went to like a rug shop and he, and he he stripped off and he put a rug around him and like was in the and we got him to be in like the forest. And it went on YouTube and it was like the wild man of like Fetford Forest or something. And <laughs> next thing you know, it's getting loads of people like commenting and everything. And it's the same sort of thing. They were just having fun, weren't they? Messing about with someone. But yeah. they've gone to quite a lot of effort there by making some template Bigfoot, you know, putting a bit of strap on it and everything. I mean, they're super cool. What are your thoughts on Bigfoot yeah. though? Are you a believer in Bigfoot? If there's any field within the realm of the paranormal that offers the most promise, mm. it's the field of cryptozoology. Oh, you know, okay. we are still finding organisms that we weren't aware were alive on our planet every mm. every year, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Look at the coelacanth, for instance. You know, the coelacanth is on the, uh, the logos and the stickers of the International Cryptozoology Museum owned by Lauren Coleman up in uh, Maine, because this was a creature that we believe to be extinct that we found is a very real living thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many, so many fascinating creatures. Uh, the Okapi, you know, the lowland gorilla, there, there were so many of these creatures that we didn't think were real. You know, we'd only heard of in legend and, yeah. and then turns out to be there's real, you know, there could be giant snakes in the Amazon that we haven't documented yet. You know, uh, it's it's definitely something that I think people should take a little bit more seriously. Yeah, and well, there's, there's that guy I don't know if Bigfoot that. has the most opportunity to be real, <laughs> yeah. but I would love there to be a giant primate, you know, running around the uh, the forests of America. Yeah, man, it's it's a, that and the Yeti. Obviously, I mean, if you go to Nepal or somewhere like right. that, it's it's already a species. They would say it exists. You know, it's not like us here. They think it exists. You know, they actually probably have it in their book and, you know, they have a guy that goes and hunts it or whatever. But yeah, I totally am with you. It's the one where you think, oh, it could be like a sort of Nefandertal man, a missing link that has sort of ventured off. You know, there's quite a lot of, been a lot of sightings a lot of evidence but still not that definitive evidence that you need and like you were saying about all these new species that we're on you know people are now starting to sort of discover i mean is that guy on um national geographic or one of those channels who had uh, that forest galant or whoever he is and he goes out and he finds like extinct and he's he found that tortoise that they thought was extinct i mean he's after the phylocene i mean the phylocene a Tasmanian tiger. I think that's something that's probably out there somewhere, you know, and I think now that we've got camera traps and stuff like that, something's going to come out soon, something big, you know, and I hope it's something like a Bigfoot or, you know, a Yeti or a Phylocene or the Loch Ness Monster, you know, all these things are pretty cool, aren't they? Well, you know, in our lifetime, you know, we're going to see woolly mammoths again. Oh, yeah, that's they're cool actively they're working. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm bringing woolly mammoths back. Yeah. You know, it, do we have an obligation um, as, you know, the keepers of this planet to bring things back mm -hmm. that we had a direct yeah. hand in causing the demise of? You know, we have enough DNA to bring back, you know, the moa, elephant birds, uh, the thylacine, you know, these no, are things that we might yeah. actually be able to see again. Yeah, they're definitely doing it. It's all out there. If you go and find out, I mean, they're definitely trying to bring back the thylacine. The mammoth's going to be the first one that they've, they, they've basically done it, I think. You know, you're just not seeing it really in the mainstream yet, but they're doing it for global so-called climate change. They're doing it. Yeah. Basically. That's how they got the funding, I think, for it. You know, uh, you know the massively deep pockets because something to do with um the deforestation or you know it's something to do with that and it's going to the offset the carbon i don't know the full details but that's what my, the gist is what i got but yeah it's going to be mad but like you say i don't they're not going to be the exact species they're going to be something that we have derived from and any and as such artificial really aren't they do you get what i'm saying because then even though they're natural 
They're still so... You know, I don't know if it's going to be um, a hybrid of sorts or if they're able to strip the DNA yeah, of the uh, egg that they're getting from the Asian elephant. Um, yeah, I don't I'm think not they can well quite get it. At all. I, I, no, nor am I, but I don't think they can quite get it. Do you get what I'm saying? I don't think they can quite get the full amount yeah. of DNA. So it's not going to be the exact thing. But it's still going to be cool. I mean... It'd be dope, wouldn't it, to walk about and see a woolly mammoth, you know? <laughs> Maybe you could go, like, in Thailand right. when you ride on the Indian elephants. You could probably go and ride on a woolly mammoth in Siberia if you want to, you know, in our lifetimes, which is going to be super cool, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. Calvin, um, look, mate, I could talk to you, like, literally all day, and um, but we sort of got to a lot of the time that we usually do a podcast for. Um, Please, mate, we'd love to have you back on the Wonder Camera podcast. Anytime you're ready, because, man. You just let me know. Because Give me a time and a place and I'll be there. Yeah, because, you you know, we've just seen a small bit of your collection. Now, can you just tell everybody where they find you, um, what you do, because you're on social media and stuff. Um, just do that, please, mate. Yeah. Um, I would love for everybody to follow me on Instagram. Um, I do a lot of fun stuff. I bring everybody along on my adventures. Uh, sometimes you get to see me off-roading in a rental car looking for Stonehenge. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes you get to see the new stuff that I find. Um, uh, you can find me on Instagram at The Occult Collector. Um, I barely use Twitter, but I'm The Occult Collector there. Essentially, I've got The Occult Collector on lock. If you guys look up The Occult Collector anywhere, you can find me. Um, and if you happen to be a fan of tattoos... Um, I also have my tattoo portfolio on Instagram as Calvin Von Crush. So, yeah, come get a tattoo. We'll talk about spooky shit. <laughs> That's cool, man. Cool. Um, well, Calvin, um, thanks again for coming on.